Welcome to One Church. I look. You welcome. <laughs> welcome to One Church. Welcome to One Church. I'm Luke. You're welcome. <laughs> I'm Luke. Welcome to One Church. You're welcome. Two. Three. Four. It's <laughs> 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 over. Well, welcome to One Church. My name is Laura and I'm one of the pastors here. We are a new church starting on October 4th of 2020 and we are so glad that you're here checking out one of our preview services. We are currently in the process of looking for a physical location. We are still raising funds and we're building our team. If you're interested in becoming a team member, please send us a message. We'd love to hear from you. To partner with us through giving or prayer, you can check out visitonechurch.com slash Manteca. Now, we want to know that you are here today. We're going to give you a quick break to follow the link in the comments to um, fill out our online connection card. So just put in your name, so maybe some more information that you want to share with us, and you're done. Okay? Ready? Click the link and go. Hey Google, what's on my agenda for today? Nothing. Your calendar is emptier than the cleaning aisle at the grocery store. Google, seriously, there's gotta be something on my agenda today. I suggest you sit down for this. This is gonna hurt my man. At 9, you'll start eating and won't stop until you're in bed. Because your friend said quarantine calories don't count and they don't know about science. At 10, you'll stare at the scale realizing that as the number of COVID cases are going down, the numbers on your scale are going up. So much for curve flattening. At 11, you'll do 10 push-ups to prove to the world you still got it. You'll probably get injured but don't let them see you cry. At 12, you'll learn how to make your own butter. At 2, you'll go to the store so your family does not have to. And it will make you feel like a hero. You are so brave. You inspire me to be a better machine. At 3, you'll accidentally touch your face. Fear the worst and update your life insurance policy. At 4 p.m. you'll make a TikTok video that will horrify your kids and that you'll probably regret in 10 years. Stick to Facebook, you old man. At midnight, you'll stay awake wondering if you have what it takes to survive the apocalypse. If you want to know the answer to that, go ahead and rewatch your push-up video. Anything else? Receive mercy. Your faithfulness is clear to see. It's constant every day. Every breath I breathe, an invitation to believe you are creating. So Tell my story I know you'll move mountains for me You're just that good So 
give thanks to God. We truly have so much to be thankful for. We have been invited into the kingdom of God. We have been bought at a high price. Listen to this, John 15, 13 says, Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. And that's exactly what Jesus did. He gave his all for us. You see, we'll never understand that kind of love because it's not the kind of love that we have. Our love can be conditional. Our love can have limits, but not God's. God's love is 100% unconditional and it has no limits, it has no bounds. Would you die for somebody that you loved? Probably, but would you die for somebody who deceived you? Would you die for somebody who rejected you? Would you die for somebody who hurt you so very deeply? Paul tells us this in Romans 5, for while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners, you see, God stood before creation. He saw everything that you would ever do, good and bad. He saw all of our sin, and yet he still went forward with his plan to become a man, to die for us, to die a gruesome death on a cross for you and for me. He loves you so very deeply, and you can't outrun his love. Sing this with us. Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. And you have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. And you have been so, so No shadow you won't light up 
mountain you won't climb up coming after me there's no one you won't kick down that you won't tear down coming after me there's no shadow you won't light up mountain you won't climb up coming after me Lord God, thank you. Thank you for the love, God, that you have for us, for the sacrifice that you made for us, Lord God, even though we're not deserving of it, Lord God. You're so good to us. Thank you for being with us as we've come together to worship you, Lord. Thank you. Be with us as we continue on in your word, Lord God. Let us hear your word and let us put it deep into our hearts, Lord God. And let me ask you, Lord. I hope you all are doing well. I hope you grabbed yourself a cup of coffee and you're ready to, uh, to enjoy the Word of God with me. I'm going to take some of this right now because I need it, all right? Trust me, you don't want me to preach without this stuff. You know what? I think it is always in the will of God to have coffee. That is my theory the mission statement of my life. So, um, plus I stayed up really late last night. Um, but we're going to dive into the Word. We're going to enjoy it today. Uh, today we're talking about agenda, living in the will of God. How do you live in the will of God? Um, and oftentimes when we think of God's will, we think of specific things that we were uniquely designed for, right? Uh, when you're a teenager, you ask God, God, what do you want me to do with my life? What's my vocation? When you're in your 20s, you're asking God questions like, God, who do you want me to marry? Uh, when you're in your 30s, you might still be asking that question. We're praying for uh, all the single people out there. But you're also asking things like, God, what do I do with my kids? Um, give me some advice for how to you know, go about this relationship with some of my friends. Uh, we think about our specific design, what God has uniquely designed us for. But I think that there are actually two expressions of the will of God. There is what you are uniquely designed for, and then there are, um, there's a general will of God, something that God asks all of us as human beings to step into um, that, that love Him. And so today, we're going to be looking at the general will of God. What does God want all of us to do and to step into? Let me just give you a quick foreshadowing. Um, he wants us to die. Sorry. I know. It's, I'm, let me pray for us. We're going to need it. I'm going to need it. Uh, but I'm excited to teach it to you today. So Lord Jesus, I pray for your people. God, wherever they're at, in their living rooms, uh, in their cars, who knows, wherever they're at, God, I pray that you would bless them, that your spirit would flood that room, and I pray that you would bring revival to their soul. I pray today that the spirit of God would come in and begin to touch your people. God, wherever they're at, I pray that they would be touched by this word today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I have always been a musician uh, since I was 14. I loved music. It's, it was the passion of my life when I was a teenager. Uh, and I always had this dream of having my own recording studio. So when I was 14, I started accumulating stuff, right? I got the soundboards and the mixers and the microphones and I started my own recording studio when I was 14 in my house. Um, 
and I always had this dream of having my own recording studio when I grew up, like my own room dedicated to it. But because I lived in the Bay Area, I could never have a house that was big enough to have an extra spare room. That's just not something we had uh, when we lived in the Bay. But when we moved out to Manteca, when we bought this big old beautiful house, we, you know, I was doing the math. I'm like, okay, we got three rooms. Laura and I is going to share a room. Luke is going to have his own room. And now I've got an extra room and I can move my recording studio stuff into that room. I can have my own recording room. Uh, well, plot twist. Um, we find out we're pregnant two months after we move in and all of a sudden my dream of having my own recording studio starts dying. Uh, I had this recording room and, and now we're starting to move like cribs and dressers in there. So now this recording room has turned into a recording closet that I share with a hundred tiny dresses that will eventually be my little girls, right? And, and I know that when she comes on July 12th, I'm going to be kicked out of that room completely. And my recording closet is going to turn into a recording box in the garage that will never be opened again um, because I have to make room for her. And uh, right now, part of myself is dying. Part of my dreams, my desires, my passions are dying to make way for something way more beautiful and way more important. And that's my relationship with my daughter. She's coming in. And in this new relationship, there is no room for my needs, my desires, my wants. She occupies every bit of space in my heart and in my life, and there is no longer any room for me. And so instead of living for my desires and my wants, I begin to live for her desires and her wants. I die to myself. But as I die to myself and I invest in her desires, what I find is that I, as I invest in these desires, and her needs and her wants, I come alive in a brand new way. I begin to fall in love with her and I begin to fall in love with my role as a dad. I love being a dad and I love taking care of her. So as I die, I actually come alive in a brand new way than I never thought. And me investing in her needs and her desires actually brings me more happiness than if I were to invest in my own needs and in my own desires. And the same is true for our relationship with God. When we come into a relationship with God, God moves in and there's no space for us. I mean, our desires, our wants, our, our needs oftentimes get put on the back burner so that we can invest in God's desires, God's wants, God's needs. Now, as God moves in, he demands our attention, he demands our focus, and we begin to die to ourselves. But as we die to ourselves, we find that as we serve God's will and God's desires, we begin to come alive in a new way that we never expected. All of a sudden, we find happiness not in serving our own will, but in serving the will of God and serving the desires of God. As God moves into your life, living for Jesus means dying to yourself. Now, Jesus cannot be fully known outside of absolute commitment. You don't know Jesus unless you are absolutely committed to him. And I know some of you right now, you're like, I love Jesus. I love him as the teacher. I love him as uh, you know, a, a good man. He's a, he's a wise person. I love that Jesus. But I wanna, I wanna tell you just a bit of truth here for a second. Jesus says that if you do not know him as king and as Lord, you do not know him at all. The only way to true life in Christ is by allowing Jesus to be the Lord and the King of your life. And if Jesus is not King, then you do not truly know him. And in the passage we're going to read today, Jesus draws a line, man. He draws a hard line. Um, and we all draw lines every day. You know, as a parent, I draw lines all the time. My son loves running around the house naked. It's one of his favorite things to do. And I think it's hilarious. You know, he runs around. He's like, Daddy, Lukey is Nicky boy, Nicky boy, Nicky boy. And I just crack up, man. I laugh so hard. Um, but at some point, I look at my son and say, hey, bud, look, we got to put on clothes. And he doesn't like it. And he throws a fit. But I have to draw the line. I have to exert my authority over his personal freedom in that moment because I know what's best for him. And in this passage, Jesus draws a line and he says, I want you to come in and invite me to come into your life, to be your authority and to come in and actually override some of your personal freedom. That's what Jesus asks us to do. He says, I want you to come in or I want you to ask me to come in and be your Lord and be your savior. Now, this is this is tough for our culture. Um, Tim Keller, he puts it like this. He says, in the American culture, we live for dignity. In every other culture throughout the history of the world, we've lived for honor. And dignity finds, finds our, our sense of worth and our sense of value in people's personal freedom. So dignity says, I have a right to be happy. 
and I can do whatever it takes. I can pick whatever path I choose in order to become happy. And your happiness actually overrides your responsibility to other relationships. But dignity is, is kind of the opposite. Dignity is actually finding your value and your worth in the role that you play. We all have roles, right? I'm a dad, I'm a father, I'm a son. There are rules that I have to play and there are certain responsibilities within those roles that I have to step into. And when I step into those, I actually find value in those relationships. I have to die to myself in those relationships because I have responsibilities that I don't necessarily want to fulfill. Not all the time, right? There's certain days where I wake up and I'm like, oh, it's really hard to play dad today. Like I'm so done watching Paw Patrol. But at some point I have to say no to myself. But the happiness and the joy that I find in fulfilling that role is much greater than the joy that I find in my own personal freedom. So I submit my personal happiness and my personal freedoms to pursue happiness in another way, to pursue it in my role. And in, in this passage today that we're going to read, Jesus is very much emphasizing um, honor over dignity. And this is not a popular message because we love dignity over honor. Okay, so when I was thinking of this message, this is going to be the message that's really difficult for some of you. And when I was thinking about the illustration of how I can explain this message, um, I, I'll explain it like this. I, I want you to imagine a friend calls me and he says, hey, Anthony, I'm climbing up Mount Everest. Would you go with me? Well, I'm going to pick up the phone and I'm going to say, hey, I will absolutely go with you. I am so down. And I'll, I'll dude, I'll take the trip to Nepal or where... I, I think that's where Mount Everest is. I, like, I'll take the trip. I'll jump on the plane. I'll start climbing up the mountain with you. But I'm imagining at some point, there's going to come a time where I have to, I got to tap out. I mean, it might be 5,000 feet, might be 10,000 feet. I don't know. But at some point, it's going to cost me too much. It's going to be too cold. It's going to be too dangerous. And that's exactly how this verse is. Um, this is one of those verses where some of you, you've been walking with Jesus for a long time. And this is the moment where you say, you know what? This thing is going to cost me too much. Jesus, you got to go the rest of the way without me. This is where I get off. This is where I stop. But I want you to know if this is the moment where you stop, you are stopping short of life itself. Jesus says, life is found in going to the top of the mountain with me. Life is not found in stopping short, is not in, in valuing me as a good teacher, but life is found in having me be the Lord of your life, taking control and complete authority over your life. And if you would just go with me, you will find eternal life that satisfies you to the deepest places of your heart and your soul. Don't stop short. Go with Jesus to the top. Because if you do, you're going to find him and you're going to find life like you never found before. So today we're going to look at a verse. We're going to use some, uh, some fun new tools. Uh, and in this verse, there's a command and Jesus gives us a reason why we should obey that command. So we're going to look at the command and the reason why. Now in this passage, we're coming off a passage where Jesus looks at his disciples and he says, Hey, I'm going to be a king, but I'm going to be the king that takes his throne by suffering and dying. And Jesus says, I'm the king of the world. I'm the king of, uh, of all of eternity. My rule is forever. But the way that I take my throne is by suffering and dying on a cross. And uh, we, we see in the last passage that Peter rebukes Jesus. He says, how dare you? And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. There's this whole big conflict. And now we're kind of in the heat of the conflict. And I would imagine that the disciples in this moment are like, Jesus if you are not here to be a political leader, then what are we doing here? What are we doing here? And Jesus pulls them in and he even invites in the crowds. He says, hey, you want to know what, well, you want to know what we're doing here? Everybody, come, come close. I'm, I'm so excited to tell you this. I, man, can't wait. You want to know what we're doing? We're dying. That's what we're doing. I mean, could you imagine the shock and the horror? They're like, wait, we're dying? Jesus says, yeah. That's what we're doing here. We're dying. We're not taking thrones. We're not taking charge. We're not overthrowing oppression. We are dying. And he says, that is God's will for my life, but that's also God's will for all of your lives. I'm dying and I want you to come with me. Could you imagine the shock and the horror? These guys are like, wow, I guess I'm dying. And Jesus, he uh, begins to, to quote this verse. We're gonna use a, a cool new tool here, all right? I've never used this before. Um, but I, I think it's going to be helpful for diagramming uh, this verse. Okay, so here's what we have in this verse. Let me just give you kind of the overview, all right? 
this is a, uh-oh, uh-oh, there it is. This is the command right here. And calling to the crowd along with him, um, to him along with the disciples, he said to them, if anyone would follow me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Then after this command, Jesus actually gives four different reasons why we should follow him, why we should deny ourselves, why we should take up our cross. And each of those phrases actually begins with the word for. Uh, we're only going to look at one of those today. And we're going to really dissect the command. Jesus says to deny ourselves and to take up our cross. So what does that mean? What does it mean to deny ourselves and to take up our cross? Now, when we think of denying ourselves, what does our culture often think of? Well, let me just type this in, okay? I'm going to type in deny yourself into this little, uh, this little GIF sidebar here. This is oftentimes what we think about right here. Tom Haverford, right? This guy is famous from Parks and Rec, and uh, he came up with, with this whole day called Treat Yourself. And on Treat Yourself Day, you, you give in to every desire that you want. You never tell yourself no. You buy everything you want. You do everything you want. And he was famous for this. And so we think that the opposite of denying ourselves is treat yourself. And so we think that actually denying ourselves is resisting those desires, those pleasures in life that we want, aka living miserable every day. But that's clearly not it. I mean, you think about it. God is the author of pleasure. He, he created joy. He created life itself. And in fact, in the Old Testament, he establishes a day, one day a week, where we are to fully invest ourselves in resting and enjoying life. God doesn't want you to be miserable. That's not what it means to deny yourself. I want you to think, um, instead of resisting, I want you to think of this. I want you to think more along these lines, okay? Now, forgive me for the political nature of this illustration. Um, and I know some of you right now are tempted in the chat bar to, to like type in something crazy political. I want you to just put this verse into practice right now, okay? Deny yourself. Let's not get crazy. I'm going to use the position rather than the person here, okay? So this is obviously Mike Pence. He is the Vice President of the United States. I want you to think of denying yourself rather than being um, about resisting. I want you to think about it in terms of rank. Okay? He is second in command, which means he is underneath the authority of the president. And so if there is ever a moment where they come into conflict, where they need to make a decision um, and they have a difference of opinion, one person's voice carries more weight than the other, and that's the president. And the vice president has to bow to the authority of the president in that moment. And what Jesus is asking us to do when, when he's asking us to deny ourselves, he is asking us to demote ourselves. He's saying, hey, would you come under my leadership and my authority? And if there's ever a moment where you don't feel like doing what I tell you to do, if there's ever a moment where you disagree with what I say, your job is to give in. Your job is to deny yourself. And, and we know that this stuff happens all the time, right? There's certain days where you wake up and you're like, I don't want to read my word. Certain days where you wake up and you're like, I don't want to pray. Certain days where you wake up and you're like, I'm so bitter at this person. I don't want to forgive this person. And God is asking you to do that. And so your job is to say, yes, Lord, you are the king. You are the Lord of my life. It means to take on a different role in life. And yes, that might be sometimes resisting certain things in your life. God might be asking you to give up certain pleasures because they're bad for you, but that word resistance is way too narrow. Jesus wants us to demote ourselves and take on a new role, okay? Now, what is it not? Denying yourself is actually not um, losing your sense of personhood. Oftentimes, people use this phrase, deny yourself, as an excuse to abuse themselves, as an excuse to neglect themselves. That's not what Jesus is saying here. In fact, I've heard so many people um, use this as an excuse to dive full on in ministry and not have a personal life, a social life, and neglect their family. I mean, they give 100% of their time in ministry, into serving God, doing God's will, but in the end, they're neglecting things that God has actually asked them to do. They're dying to things um, that God has never asked them to die to, and they're actually doing things that God never asked them to do. They're dying to the wrong things. And because of that, their lives are falling apart. Look, this is not self-neglect. Take care of yourself. This is not you denying yourself hobbies in order to serve the church 24-7. That's not what this is. And that's not what God is asking you to do. He's asking you to be demoted 
to take on a different role and to submit to him. So then he goes on, he says, um, deny yourself, take up your cross. Now let's think about what that actually means, okay? The cross, if you actually, um, when you think about it, the cross really represents a few different things, okay? The cross represents, um, it, it's something that represents uh, rejection. The cross represents shame. The cross represents suffering. The cross represents, ultimately, it represents death, right? So when you look at what the cross actually represents, it represents those things. Rejection, shame, suffering, and death. Now, what Jesus is saying here is he's asking us to step into those things. He's saying, do you love me enough to be willing to die for me, to be willing to be rejected for me? Do you love me enough to take on shame? Do you love me enough that when the world looks at you and they're, they're, they, they create an opinion of you, their opinions are not good. Do you love me enough to be willing to go to that point? Do you love me all the way into death. Now, death is the ultimate act of self-denial. Because you think about it, what's the instinct that we all have from the very beginning? Preserve your life. We all want to preserve our life. I mean, that's the reason why we wear helmets. That's the reason why we eat vegetables. That's the reason why I lose 90% of the arguments that I have with my, with my wife. Because I want to preserve my life, right? I'm a smart guy. I want to live. So the ultimate act of denying yourself is actually giving up your own life voluntarily. And Jesus says, will you give up your life? Will you go to that extreme? Now, I know that that's that's an extreme and and not all of us are going to live there. But the early Christians did. And there are actually Christians around the world right now that are giving up their lives for the sake of the gospel. I want you to think about it like a spectrum. There's a spectrum of self-denial, a scale of self-denial. On one end of the spectrum, there's the the daily decisions that we have. Now, most of you will live in that place where you are deciding daily to follow God and you're denying yourself little things, right? Like, don't do this, don't do this, forgive this person. And that feels like death in the moment. It's self-denial. Those are your daily decisions. Some of you will, you know, maybe live right here where you're in an addiction and there's a certain desire in you that's really, really strong and God is asking you to give that up and it really feels like death. And you really go through some painful stuff to deny yourself. But then there's people that are over here that are actually suffering at work. Like people are, um, people are saying bad things about you. People are um, not giving you the positions that you should have because you're a Christian, because you have faith and you're being persecuted in the workplace. Um, and that's very few of us, by the way. We live in a great culture where, you know, most of, that, most of us don't ever experience that. But there are people around the world right now that are giving their lives. And what Jesus is asking us to do is he's saying from the daily decisions all the way to the point of death, he says, and everything in between, I want to own that. I want your life to be mine. I want you to be willing to make daily decisions where you deny yourself, but also I want you to get to the point where even unto death, you will give your life for me. And even unto death, I have ownership over you. Now, Jesus says um, in this passage, he said, everyone should take up his cross. Not Jesus's cross, but our own personal cross. We all have a cross to bear. There's um, something that God is asking us to do that's really hard, that's really difficult, and we have to take that on. And we don't like it in the moment, and it feels like death in the moment, but Jesus says that actually leads to life. You have a cross that God is asking you to take on. There is something that God is asking you to do that's painful, that's hard, that involves suffering, it involves shame, it could involve death, and death to yourself. But God is asking you to step into it. What is that thing today? What have you been denying God access to that God wants access to? What have you said to uh, no to God about? Okay, so then it goes on. So that's what it means to deny ourselves and to take up our cross. Then it goes on um, and it says this. It says, Forever who, uh, for who, uh, whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for the sake of the gospel and my uh, and me will save it, right? So you got some really interesting things happening here. You got somebody who's trying to save their life, but they're actually losing it. And then there's somebody who's losing their life, and that person is actually saving their life. And this can can really easily be, be confusing, right? So just like I said before, we all want to save our lives, right? We all want to preserve our own life. But what we find here is that the person that tries to save his life is actually losing his life. 
Uh, and so what, what we really need to understand about this verse is what Jesus meant by saving your life, because the person that saves his life actually loses his life. What did Jesus mean? It's super confusing, but let me, let me just um, help you by, by diagramming it a little bit. Jesus said we should take up our cross. Now, cross is a symbol of death. It's the opposite of saving our life. So saving our life actually means the opposite of taking up our cross. It's somebody who wants to live for the opposite of the cross. Now, what is the cross? The cross is rejection, it's shame, it's suffering and death. So in order to save your life, um, saving your life means living for the opposite of that, living for acceptance, not living for rejection. It actually means living for glory, not living for shame, living for comfort, not living for suffering, and living for safety, not living for death. That's what it means to save your life. Jesus says you're investing yourself in the things of this world. You really care about what people think about you. You really care about other people's opinions of you. And you, you, you think about it all the time. You obsess about it. You live for your own glory. I mean, if, if there was a movie about life, you would be the main character in the main role. You would be the star of the movie. You're what it's all about. And that's what you're living for. You're living for your own glory. Now, all of us live in a level of this. We have a level of this inside of us. We all live for our own glory. Even those of you that are quiet, I know you might say to yourself, well, I'm a humble person. I, I just like to sit in the background. Yeah, but as you sit in the background, there are still selfish desires that stir in your heart that make you want glory. All of us have this. And we all live for our own glory and our own acceptance and for our comfort and our safety. We want as much as we can possibly get out of this life in terms of acceptance, glory, safety, and comfort. But Jesus uses a very interesting word here for the word life that I think will help us unlock this passage. He says, whoever wants to save his life. Now, what does it mean to save your life? Well, Jesus um, uses a very specific word for life that actually has two different connotations, can be used in two different ways. It can be a physical life, but it also can be eternal life. It's two different words, physical and eternal, that Jesus is using here for the word life. Okay, why does he use physical life and eternal life? Well, he's using physical life and eternal life because here what we're seeing is somebody wants to save their life, and Jesus wants that play in the word life. Because to save your life means to invest in this physical world right now. And what he says is, if you save your life, if you invest in all of the pleasures that you want in this physical world and you neglect the eternal life that you have ahead of you, you neglect God, you are investing in this physical world right now, but you will lose your life for eternity. And those who neglect their life right now, that are not living for glory, they're not living for suffering, not living for the, the same things that everybody else is living for, but they're living for God and they submit to his authority. What they're doing is they're investing in eternity. They're dying now, but they gain life in eternity. And that's why Jesus uses this word life. I want you to think about it like this. Um, think about this. This is the timeline of your life. Okay. This is the timeline of your, your life. You are an eternal being okay now this little black line right here it i hope you can see it it represents your time on earth the 90 years that you are here on this planet that's what this represents and what jesus is saying is, is people are living for this they're living for pleasure for glory for acceptance right here they care about what everybody else thinks about and they forget about the fact that their life is going to go on for eternity they live just for this moment. And what they do is they invest everything they have in this moment into things that do not matter and it ends up affecting their eternity. They live for this physical life in this physical world and it ends up ruining their eternity. I want you to take a step back for a second and understand that you are not just the 90 years that you live on this planet. You are not just, um, you are not just alive as your heart beats and the blood pumps through your vein. But the moment that your heart stops beating and there's no more blood in your veins anymore, or the blood starts, stops moving in your veins, you enter into eternity. You will still be around. Your life will go on. So do me a favor. Take a step back right now. Think about your life. 
You're not just this physical person. You're not just this physical body, but you are an eternal creature that has a destiny. You are destined for heaven. But if you live for this moment, you will lose that. You will miss out on that if you are just living for glory here on earth and you don't care about God and you're neglecting God's will and God's plan for your life. Jesus says that there's one destination here, right? The person that's trying to save his life wants life. The person that loses their life gains life. There is one destination in two different routes in order to get to that destination. Jesus says the world has created a counterfeit to life. Uh, The world has created something that promises them life, comfort, acceptance, glory. And the world says, look, if you have these things, then you will truly have life. But Jesus says, those people that invest in those things, they think they're going to get life, but in the end, they actually get death. Jesus says, there are things that if you invest your life in right now, those things, they feel like life in the moment, they actually lead to death. And there is a way of investing your life where in the moment, it actually feels like death. It's suffering, it's hard, it's difficult, but in the end, it will lead to true life in Christ and life for eternity. We get so focused on what's right in front of us. We get so obsessed with the momentary needs and desires that we have that we forget that we have a life that spans eternity. If you want true life, if you want true eternal life the way that Jesus has come to offer it, it's going to take three things. It's going to take, number one, trusting Jesus. you got to trust Him. Trust that what He's saying is right, that He's telling you the truth. Number two, it's going to take you willing to embrace suffering. you got to step into suffering and say, you know what? I might die in this life, but I'm going to get life for eternity. And then the last thing is um, you, you've got to have vision for your life that's, that's bigger than just this moment right here. You've got to take a step back and look at your life as an eternal being. Your life will go on forever. How are you investing your life, your resources, your passions, your desires? Are you investing your desires into God's will and into God's plan for your life? Or are you investing your desires in yourself, in acceptance, in glory, in comfort, and in safety? Living for Jesus means dying to you. Would you do this? Would you pray with me? And maybe you're here and this is really tugging on your heart. You're like, yeah, I I feel this. I've been in charge. And I've been doing this all myself. And this is the moment where I have to take a step back and I have to say, God, you're in charge. You're my authority. Give me life. Let me die. If that's you, I want you to pray this prayer with me. Maybe you've never prayed this for the, uh, at all and this is your first time praying this. Man, I just want to celebrate you right now. This is a huge step. We want to know about it. We want to walk with you. I want to walk with you personally. I want you to know that. Just because you're out on the internet and your, your life is you know, anonymous on the internet, I want you to know I want to walk with you personally. We want to do this thing with you and help you walk this thing with Jesus out. So would you do this? Would you pray with me? Just say, Lord Jesus, come and be with me. Right now in this moment, I invite you into my room, wherever I'm at. I invite you into my life. I invite you into my heart. Lord, you sit on the throne of my heart. You are the king. Every decision that I make, every desire that I have, everything belongs to you. God, I submit my life to you. I give it to you. And today I want to live for you. I want to invest in eternity rather than just this small, tiny window that I live in here on this earth. Lord, we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, hey, if you just prayed that prayer for the very first time, congratulations. It's amazing. It's amazing. You will never regret it. I've never regretted following Jesus in my life. Um, God has brought me so much hope, so much joy, so much life. So congratulations if that's you. If that's you, here's what I want you to do. Um, Would you just pick up your phone right now? Would you text, text the words, follow Jesus to the number 31996? And when you do that, that's going to do is it's going to send you a text back with a link to a Google form. Fill that out. Give us as much information as as you feel comfortable with. And one of our pastors is going to reach out to you this week. And we're going to pray with you. We're going to walk with you. We're going to tell you what your next steps are um, as somebody that is is coming into relationship with Jesus. Well, hey guys, now's our time where we jump back into worship. So if God is is tugging on your heart, I just encourage you to, to take this opportunity and ask yourself, God, what's next? Think about, is is my commitment level up or have I been kind of apathetic? I mean, have I really been all in with Jesus or have I just been giving him a little bit of my life? Think about that. Pray about that. 
and surrender your life to God today as we worship Him. Thank you that you are everything that we need. You are everything, everything to us, God. We love you. Thank you for this time in worship and thank you for this time in your word. We give you all the praise and all the glory. Amen. Thank you. 
Thank you so much for joining our preview service today. If you want to find out more about following Jesus, text follow Jesus to 31996 and one of our team members will contact you. It would mean the world to us if you shared us with a friend. We are brand new work in Manteca and we know that God has great things in store for our city. Hope you have a great week. You can always get in contact with us through www.visitonechurch.com slash Manteca. Hope to hear from you soon.